Genesis chapter 19. Let's finish this chapter. It's a very pathetic, sad chapter of a man who had everything but lost everything because he decided not to follow God's ways. And that's the sad thing. Don't ever get sucked into the world. If you get sucked into the world, then you might think that you have everything at the beginning, but then at the end you lose everything. So don't be like that. Uh, the Christian, it's the opposite. You feel like you lost everything, sacrificed everything at the right. beginning, right. but then you gain any, everything at the end. That's yeah. always how the Christian life works. Yeah. If you've been a saved believer for several years, you started to notice that, right? You're not at the full point yet, but you start to notice that, and you know what I'm talking about. All right, Genesis chapter 19. Now remember, at verse 31, I'm not going to comment on it again, but at verse 31, uh, the firstborn is saying to the younger daughter that their, their father is not going to be able, and their family line is not going to be able to have future generations. So she also said there is not, <coughs> excuse me, she also said that there's not a person in the world that will be able to come into them and they can continue on the lineage after the manner of all the earth, which is interesting. It's not going to follow the ways of how the world does things. So you'll notice that they're very worldly minded. They're not spiritual minded. If they're going to follow the manner of all the earth, then she's going to be thinking, according to the context, how can we survive and continue on as a family after the ways of the world? So she's going to think about the worldly ways of doing things. She's not going to think the biblical way of doing things. And this is a worldly way of doing things. This is so smart. Come, let us make our father drink wine, and we will lie with him that we may preserve seed of our father. Isn't that brilliant from the world? So you notice right here that the world that their way of doing things, and you've seen it the past two years, they might give you the most rational way. And this does seem like the most rational to her, but it's still noticed absurd and nonsensical. And the evidence is the past two years, right? It is totally nonsensical. It's so chaotic. They're talking about a recession coming and even worse things happening. But it's the most logical way of doing things after the manner of all the earth the worldly way of doing things. This is the most rational, so we have no choice, so we're going to do it that way. Otherwise, our future generations are going to die out. So similar with the girls here, right? So similar. You'll notice that this is the way of the wicked world when you fall into the trap of the ways of the world. Now, you'll notice verse 32 explaining each and every word. She's saying, come, so that's an invitation. Let's do this. Let us make our father drink wine. So meaning that we're going to make our dad drink alcohol. And then the next part of the verse, it explains right here that she says, we're going to uh, sexually continue on the seed by lying with him so that we may protect the future generation from our father. Now, if it's going to be the manner of all the earth, where she learned that from, right? She learned that from the world. She watched too much TV. She watched the way that the things of Sodom has done. So, this drinking of wine is recorded in Deuteronomy from Sodom. She's looking at the way Sodom does things. Look at Deuteronomy 32, Deuteronomy 32. Look, you wouldn't be doing your sexual practices if you didn't learn it from somebody or watch something. So that's what this daughter is doing. She's following the example from what she saw things. From what she saw things. All right, Deuteronomy 32. Now notice what the Bible interestingly reads about Sodom and Gomorrah. It says right here in Deuteronomy 32 and verse, uh, let's see right here. It's a long way down. It's a pretty long chapter here. Oh, 
32. Yes, thank you, thank you. Notice at Deuteronomy 32, 32. For their vine is of the vine of Sodom and of the, and of the fields of Gomorrah. Their grapes are grapes of gall. Their clusters are bitter. Now, their wine is the poison of dragons and the cruel venom of ass. You'll notice right here that uh, Deuteronomy compared the Jews and they actually contrasted the Jews from Sodom. And they said that Sodom has its own vine and that it's poisonous. It's from what they described as dragons. Those are devils. Why would, uh, why would the author say that? Well, there's something that happened. Sodom, they grew their own grapes. Sodom grew its own wine. And then it took a little girl who grew up in Sodom, a little girl who learned sex education from her public school in the San Francisco Bay Area, and then she learned something right here. Oh, this is how sex is done. She learned something. And because of that, she went after the manner what the Bible says of the world. This is the world's way of doing things. The worldly sexual education. Sexual way of doing things. She learned after the manner of the world. Well, we have to protect our seed so you would understand that this is the only logical way. Why don't you trust in God? Abraham and Sarah, they can't produce children. Huh? They're too old. Well, this is the way of doing things, so we're going to do what? Follow the worldly way of doing things? Or are you going to trust in God and let God provide a miracle where Sarah, in spite of her old age, she produced seed? You know why? They went far down the road of worldliness, forsaking the Lord, that they're like, the, we got nothing left except what we learned at Sodom. So let's continue it down. So Christians, learn that lesson. Don't fall for that trap. Let's look at verse 33. <clears throat> and they made their father drink wine that night, and the firstborn went in and lay with her father. So it's self-explanatory. They made their father drink alcohol at the nighttime, and then the elder daughter went over there and then sex, uh, had sex with her father. And he perceived not when she lay down nor when she arose. So the father had no idea when she actually uh, laid, down, uh, laid down with him or when she woke up and went away from the bed. He was dead drunk. Where'd she learn that from? Did she went through an experience like that herself in one of those parties? Did she see stuff like that at the bar rooms of Sodom? Some guy or some girl taking a partner out? And then where the person has no idea, and then they do say, where did she learn that from? She didn't learn it herself. She learned it from Sodom. And it came to pass on the morrow, so, and it came to pass, is self-explanatory, that's a metaphor saying, so what happened at the next day that the firstborn said unto the younger, Behold, I lay yesternight with my father. So the older daughter says to the younger daughter, uh, Behold, so remember that's a term that's occasionally used at the book of Genesis. So basically, listen up or look now. Yesterday night, uh, last night, basically, I had sex with my dad. Let us make him drink wine this night also. So she's saying, let's force him to drink alcohol at this night as well. And go thou in and lie with him that we may preserve seed of our father. So she's telling the younger daughter, so I want you to go in as well. I want you to sexually lie with him as well so that we may preserve our lineage from our father and continue it on. Uh, today is Father's Day, in case for some of you who didn't know. Now, some Father's Day Lot had, if that was the case, right? Verse 35, And they made their father drink wine that night also. And the younger arose and lay with him. So they made their father drink alcohol at, at that night too. The younger daughter rose up and then sexually lied with him. And he perceived not when she lay down nor when she arose. Same thing, 
he had no idea when she lay down next to him in the bed or when she got off the bed when she woke up. Thus were both the daughters of Lot with child by their father. Hence, what happened after that? Both daughters from uh, Lot, they were pregnant with child by their own father. And the firstborn bare a son and called his name Moab. The same is the father of the Moabites unto this day. And the younger she also bare a son and called his name Ben-Ami. The same is the father of the children of Ammon unto this day. All right, I'm going to explain every word. I'm pretty sure that you understand these two verses. I don't have to explain every word, but I'm going to do it. That way your unconscious mind can click automatically and understand every word and stop giving the excuse that I don't understand the words from this book. All right, by now, if you understood this, great, you're making great progress. That's the purpose of verse-by-verse -verse Bible study is for you to understand every word. I'm going to explain every single word. That way, you come down to a point where you get a common sense gist, all right? All right, basically what it's saying right here, look how I explain it through every word. Basically, what happened is that the oldest daughter, she was able to uh, be pregnant and give birth to a son. The name of that son is Moab. Uh, this same uh, baby that was born is a father uh, of the Moabite race all the way till this day. So Moses is the author writing this. So up till the time of Moses, the Moabites uh, lived on. The younger daughter, she also gave birth to a child. The son's name is Banami. This same child, or the baby, is the father of the children of Ammon up till Moses' timeline, up till Moses' day. Now, there are a lot of interesting verses. We're not going to look at all of them, but I want you to write these verses down about the Moabites and the Ammonites. Dr. Uckman says this, which has uh, several interesting things. He says right here, these two boys, as the other sons of Canaan, uh, I'm reading from his Genesis commentary on these verses, have quite a future ahead of them. The word Moab means, this is kind of sad and disgusting, but Moab actually means from a father. From a father. So that's where Moab came from. Uh, let's see right here. I'm going to put it here. Literally, that's what she named the child. So, uh, man, it's pretty messed up. It also has a very interesting word. Another definition is out of water, out of water. Now, you notice how Moab is close with Moses. So why was Moses named thus? Because it was, the princess said, because I drew him out of the water. So it's pretty close. So if you have a son that's named Moses, if he misbehaves, you can call him Moab, all right? The other one is Ammon. Ammon. Now Ammon, or Ammon, you can tell it's kind of similar to the Egyptians. It's like an Egyptian god name. It's kind of close to that. It means son of Ami, which is actually the god Am, or son of my people. Son of Ami, that's some kind of a deity, I think Egyptian deity. It also means son of my people. Now, you notice that the names are, when they're given names, it's for a purpose, right? They don't just name it out of coincidence. Son of my people. You can see right here what the daughters were thinking, that to preserve seed, to continue on their lineage, right? So basically, son of my people, to be able to carry on our people, our lineage. So these names were born from sin. That's the sad thing. These names were born out of sin. It's pretty disgusting, and it's pretty sad how Lot, who is a saved believer, can you believe that? He's a saved believer. The Bible says that, uh, I showed you verses, he's, uh, he's up in heaven, but he's a perfect example of a saved believer today, 
who messed up his life in the world and his next generation, because he failed to raise them right, they become very wicked and maybe even lost. So there's not uh, really a record about his daughters being saved, to my knowledge. So they're probably uh, lost unbelievers. So you have to understand right here that Lot is a perfect example of a worldly Christian, uh, a resident of San Francisco. And you have to realize that uh, when you look at your life, and we went through a lot of Genesis 19, right? I went through all the steps. Are you following the steps of Lot? Lot is a perfect sermon, a perfect sermon that you have to be wary of. Okay, now uh, going back over here, there's some very interesting things. Dr. Ruckman mentions here in his commentary, the Moabites settled east of the Dead Sea between the Jabbok and the Arnon rivers. So this is a map, and actually this is not for this chapter. It's for the next chapter, but I'm going to point it right here so you can get an idea, so you can picture it. So it's east of the Dead Sea. That's where the Moabites are at. Now, the Moabites are given as the following. Here's the negative notions that you want to write down. Number one, Moabite women caused Solomon to sin. Moabite women caused Solomon to sin. Nehemiah chapter 13, verse 26. Nehemiah chapter 13, verse 26. So that's number one. 1 Kings 11, 1. 1 Kings 11, 1. If you want, uh, I would recommend to write it down, and if you are, you're going to have to write fast. Number two, number two, the king of Moab hires Balaam to curse Israel. Number two, the king of Moab hires Balaam to curse Israel. The passage to support it is Numbers 22 through 23. Numbers chapters 22 and 23. Number three, Eglon oppresses Israel. Eglon, E-G-L-O-N, oppresses Israel. Eglon is the king of Moab, for some of you who didn't know. That's Judges 3, Judges 3. Uh, I would recommend making abbreviations uh, if that would make things easier, okay? Number four, number four, intermarriage with the Moabites. Intermarriage with the Moabites. Costs Israel 24,000 casualties. Costs Israel 24,000 casualties. Number four, intermarriage with the Moabites costs Israel 24,000 casualties. The passage is Numbers chapter 25, verse 1 through 9. Numbers chapter 25, verse 1 through 9. Number five. Number five, they are Israel's perennial enemies for 500 years. Number five, they are Israel's, they are Israel's perennial enemies, perennial enemies for 500 years, for 500 years. Passages are 1 Samuel chapter 12. 1 Samuel chapter 12, chapter 14, chapter 14, 2 Samuel chapter 8, verse 12, 2 Samuel chapter 8, verse 12, 2 Kings chapter 1, 2 Kings chapter 1, and chapter 3, chapter 3. Number six, number six, their country and their people. Their country and their people. Number six, are the objects of God's wrath at the second advent. Are the objects of God's wrath at the second advent. Number six, their country and their people are the objects of God's wrath at the second advent. The passages 
are Isaiah 16, Isaiah 16, and Jeremiah 48, Jeremiah 48. For some of you who didn't know, the present country of Moab is actually Jordan today. It's Jordan, so that's where Moab comes from. The Ammonites uh, follow the history of Moab, so this is what they are like. Number one, number one for Ammon, all right, so the Ammonites, right? So here goes the Ammonites. Number one, they inhabit the area northeast of Moab. They inhabit the area northeast of Moab. They're practically right next door to Moab, actually. So if they're east of the Dead Sea where Jordan is, then they're like right next door as well. Number two, number two, they are prohibited. They are prohibited from entering the congregation of Israel. From entering the congregation of Israel until 10 generations. Until 10 generations have passed. Until 10 generations have passed. From mixed marriage. From mixed marriage. So if you know the timeline of the Old Testament, God wanted segregated marriage, basically marriage with only the Jews. Don't marry the outsiders. You might say, why? The reason why is the outside nations, they were pagans. So God took it so seriously that if they married an Ammonite, he said that uh, if there is one that married an Ammonite, then until the 10th generation, you can come in. Number three, number three, they oppress Israel in the book of Judges. They oppress Israel in the book of Judges. And refuse to return land. And refuse to return land. Which belong to Israel. Which belong to Israel. The passages are Judges chapter 10 through 12. Judges chapter 10 through 12. Number four, number four, they are Israel's enemies. They are Israel's enemies for 500 years, for 500 years. The passages, if you want to write them down, 1 Samuel chapter 12, verse 12, 1 Samuel chapter 12, verse 12, 2 Samuel chapter 10, verse 10. 2 Samuel chapter 10, verse 10. 2 Kings chapter 24, verse 2. 2 Kings chapter 24, verse 2. All right, here's the last one. Number five, number five for Ammon. They are listed... With Moab. They are listed with Moab. With God's judgment, they are listed with Moab for God's judgment, excuse me, for God's judgment in the second advent. For God's judgment in the second advent. The passages are Zephaniah chapter 2. Verse 8 through 9. Zephaniah, chapter 2, verse 8 through 9. Jeremiah 49. Jeremiah 49. And Ezekiel 25. Ezekiel 25. Okay, so if you want to know everything about the Moabites and the Ammonites, about how negative they are throughout uh, biblical history... Those are all the passages and the points that I've given to you, all that you need to know about the Moabites and the Ammonites and where they come from. All right, now let's look at chapter 20. Chapter 20. It's pretty sad how Lot ended his life. 
Uh, we don't want anybody in this room end up like that. Amen? All right, don't end up like that. Now, I know what your mind is, you know, your mind is, you know, that's not me or, you know, uh, you know just because it happened to him, it won't happen to me and etc. You know, that's what Lot thought so too. All right, remember, Lot thought the same thing that you did too, okay? All he saw was a beautiful plain on the, uh, on the plains of Jordan. What's wrong with going over there? It was a first step towards sin. It was next door to Sodom, then he moved inside Sodom. From there, even though God saved his life through Abraham, remember? Abraham rescued the whole city and rescued Lot's life. And Lot still didn't learn his lesson. And then, like, uh, you've seen that in your life. How many times God saved your life, giving you another chance, you still won't listen. Then you lose everything down there. All right? Out of his mercy, he might spare your life and... You get spared, but then you end up out in this mountain and then raising a bunch of half-breed children, illegitimate children. It's all messed up. All right, let's look at Genesis 20. And Abraham journeyed from thence, okay, so, toward the south country. So remember that a phrase, thence, is used against. It's, it's like, hence, but there, okay? So Abraham journeyed from where he was at toward the south country. Oh, do you see a little bit of deja vu here? Didn't Abraham make that same mistake before? Where did he go? He went toward, his favorite direction is south. He, oh, this is him where he's at, Mamre. Remember? He's going south again. Didn't he learn his lesson? But uh, he's not going to, uh, he's going to go, well, just a little bit. So he's not going to go south all the way to Egypt. Remember, Egypt's down there. He's going to go, well, just a little bit south. Ah, uh, the fleshly nature, right, with us Christians. We might have learned our lesson back at Egypt. And Lord, uh, I know that I'm, I, I can be discontent with the place that I'm at. So I'll just go out by faith and trust you. And then after the lesson in Egypt, uh, just a little bit won't hurt God. <laughs> right? After summer camp, yeah, just a little bit. It's not going to be like years ago when I was in Egypt. All right? All right, so he went toward the south country and dwelled between Kadesh and Shur and journeyed and sojourned in Gerar. Okay, so where he lived was between Kadesh and Shur, where he was sojourning. Remember, sojourn means temporarily residing, is Gerar. If you look at this map, which is why I drew it out, this is the Dead Sea. Remember, memories around this location, if you recall. And then Sodom and Gomorrah, I believed I drew it somewhere around here, if I recall. So it's up in smokes. He's going south, and here's Gerar. Now, the Bible says he dwelt between Kadesh and Shur. Now, Shur is, if you go around here, you'll note uh, it's the Sinai Peninsula, and then the next part is Egypt, okay? So Shur is around that area where the Sinai Peninsula is at which is uh, right next to Egypt. Sure, if you notice your Bible, some people might wonder if it's like literally a city name. I think it's more of an area name. I think Kadesh and Shur can be more of area names because uh, if you look at the map, from what I notice in the map, it's like all that terrain, so to speak. Because if Abraham is going to dwell between Shur and Kadesh, it doesn't look like there are cities that it's in between. It's more, it looks more accurate if he went to Gerar, and Gerar is here. So if you look at Gerar, I mean, it doesn't really look like he lived between cities. I mean, it looked more like the area of Kadesh, the area of Shur, that he lived between. If you look at the map, it's too big, it's too wide, Kadesh and Shur. The Bible mentions about wilderness of Shur, uh, I think at uh, Exodus 14, when the Jews were delivered from the Egyptians. And remember, if they were going from Egypt, they're going through that Sinai Peninsula, right? So if that's the case, uh, I think, I could be wrong about that, you can double check, but it looks like they were going through the wilderness of Shur. And Kadesh, it's pretty apparent when the Jews were wandering in the wilderness for 40 years, the Bible mentioned about the uh, Kadesh as a wilderness area as well. So I think it's more accurate to say that Kadesh and Shur are more wilderness areas. 
So Abraham, he dwelt between Shur and Kadesh, their territories. If it's between them, then the verse is accurate. Gerar is in between. Gerar is a Philistine area. Look at verse 2. And Abraham said of Sarah, his wife, Oh, come on, Abraham, again? She is my sister. <laughs> so Abraham, he repeats the same mistake. He goes south. He dwells within a Philistine city, Gerar. And then what he said about his wife, Sarah, was, She's my sister. He repeats the same mistake he did in Egypt. And Abimelech, king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah. So the king of Gerar, the Philistine, his name is Abimelech, he sent forth Sarah and took Sarah for himself, just like Pharaoh. So Sarah, even though she's up in years, you can tell that she must have been a supermodel or something, okay? Which celebrities want to be, you know? Verse 3. But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night. Okay, so God, he approaches Abimelech at nighttime and then approaches it to him in a dream. I don't know if you got one of those dreams where, the Lord, where you felt like the Lord was getting on to you. And if that was the case, you probably had a nightmare. Same thing with Abimelech right here. And said to him, Behold, thou art but a dead man, for the woman which thou hast taken, for she is a man's wife. So God says to Abimelech, behold, again, that phrase is used, you are a dead man. <laughs> because the woman that you took for yourself, guess what? She actually belongs to someone else. She's a wife of someone else. But Abimelech had not come near her. And he said, however, Abimelech didn't uh, sexually approach her. He wasn't that near to her, that intimate. So he said this to God, Lord, would thou slay also a righteous nation? Said he not unto me, she is my sister, and she, even she herself said, he is my brother. Now look what he said. He says, he addresses him as Lord. How about this? This is a pagan, a heathen who don't know the word. But he even knew. He asked God, are you going to destroy a nation that's righteous? Really? A pagan heathen? How about that? Even a heathen nation, if you studied Old Testament history, has some morals. And then Abimelech continues that, didn't Abraham say to me that, hey, she's my sister? And even, yeah, yeah, she herself, even she said, Sarah said, that he's my brother. In the integrity of my heart and innocency of my hands have I done this. Notice right here he says that my heart has integrity. It's honest. It's sincere. My hands are innocent. That's a phrase, right? So my hands are innocent of this matter. It's not guilty when I did this deed, when I took her for myself. That's what he's saying to the Lord. Now, this is a pagan heathen who knew about the law, all right? Now, I mentioned this about Pharaoh. I'm going to mention this about the Philistine king. Go to Romans 2. I mentioned this so many times, but it bears repeating again. Go to Romans 2. So, when unbelievers tell you, what about the heathen who didn't heard the word? No, they have some sort of conscience that tells them what's right and wrong. They have some knowledge about the true God until education came in and educated you out of it. So, isn't that funny? So uncivilized pagan heathen have more chances of getting saved than educated idiots nowadays. Isn't that amazing? Educated idiots who get the gospel every day and know about Jesus Christ and Christianity, they have lower chances of salvation compared to a pagan heathen who didn't hear the name of Jesus once. Think about that for a while. All right, because pagans, before educated schools came in, they knew about God. They knew about morals. They knew about judgment and justice for that. They had a fear about God, even though they had the wrong kind. But the Lord, he's not an unfair God. He takes them by the best accordingly to their conscience, uh, as long as they follow the morals the best they could to their heart and grants them salvation. Look at Romans 2.13, 2.13. For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law 
shall be justified. Now remember the Philistine king said, in the innocency of my hands have I done this. See, so the Philistine king knows that what he's doing is trying to fall, follow morals of the law still. Uh, but they don't have the written law. But God says the law is according to their conscience. Verse 14, For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts some mean while accusing or else excusing one another. See that? The law is within their conscience. All right, going back, going back. Going back. Verse 6, And God said unto him in a dream, so God is still speaking to him within that dream, Yea, I know that thou didst this in the integrity of thy heart. So God says, Yeah, I know, I know, I know. You did this by the... Uh, you were sincere from your heart when you did this. For I also withheld thee from sinning against me. Therefore suffered I thee not to touch her. All right, meaning God says... That is why I also uh, prevented you, withhold you, right, from sinning against me. That's why I'm coming to you in this dream and preventing you from doing this. Therefore suffered I, meaning that's why I didn't allow you. Suffer means to allow, to tolerate, to tolerate. That's why I didn't let you. That's why I didn't allow you to uh, touch her intimately, sexually touch her, approach her. Now, uh, this is a favorite Calvinist verse, okay? This is a verse used by Calvinists that because uh, God is over here, notice that he, accordingly with his hand, was preventing and forcing Abimelech from sinning. So this seems to support the Calvinist notion right here. Let's put this above here. So this seems to be Calvinism because uh, the verse literally says that God withheld him from sinning. See that? So God forced him not to sin. So in James White's debate against David Hunt, or Dave Hunt, that was one of his favorite passages that he will use. Now, he's wrong, obviously. Why? Because I have a bias. He's always wrong. That's why, okay? <laughs> now, I'm just joking, but the point is that this seems to be a Calvinist verse that God's forcing Abimelech to do what's right, preventing him from sinning. Now, number one, if you, are, if you claim to be a Hebrew and Greek scholar and a champion of Calvinist in debates, you don't read English, okay? He failed to read the verse. Now, basically, let me explain this way before we look at the verse. I want you to go to 2 Thessalonians 2. Keep your hand here. Keep your hand here, 2 Thessalonians 2. It's easier than you think, guys, okay? It's easier than you think. The idea is this, that people don't understand. Didn't you know God can help you out with your sin? Yeah, amen, amen. That's pretty hard for some people to swallow and believe. And if you choose to do what's right, God's going to help you out to do what's right. Basically, you don't understand this, friend. No matter what free choice or decision you make, the Lord's going to not waste it. The Lord's going to utilize whatever you do in life for His glory. Think about it. Now, mankind's sin today is so apparent, especially the past three years, and they're disobeying God, they're going rogue mode, but guess what? They're fulfilling Scripture. God says the world's going to get worse and worse, paving the way for the Antichrist kingdom. See, in spite of the wrong decisions that people make today, God's going to make sure, I'm not going to waste it, I'm going to use it for my glory. Well, what if I decide to do what's right? Well, praise the Lord. Then the Lord's going to use that for his glory. Either way, he's going to get glory out of it. He's not going to waste it. Amen. So you have to understand that free choice, there's still free choice involved, but God uses those choices you make to somehow use it for his glory. Now look at this, 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 10. 
and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. Now look at this. See, they didn't receive it. They rejected it. Their free choice is, I reject God. Now look at this. And for this cause, oh, see that? For this cause, based on that, this cause, the decision that they made, I reject God. God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth but had pleasure and unrighteousness. See, God uses it. He, he sends them a strong delusion so that they can believe the lie more and then they can go to hell. Why? The reasons given at verse 12 had pleasure and unrighteousness because they decided. God puts his hand on something when you decide it. So it's not forcing. The idea, the idea is not forcing. The more, it, the more accurate term is using. Using. So this is wrong and this is wrong. What God does is that he uses the free choices that man makes. So there's a free will involved. Okay, let me hold this right here. All right. What is your heart, right? Notice it's going by the heart as 2 Thessalonians 2, correct? Depending where your heart goes, then the Lord is going to utilize it. That's the idea. Now, how do we know that's the case with Abimelech? The, look at, back at the main text, back at the main text. Genius Calvinists who they prize as, oh, greatest debaters. Oh, I did over a hundred debates, etc. Didn't even read the verse, okay? If, verse 6, God said he withheld thee from sinning against me. Why? Because, verse 4 and 5, his heart was right. Abimelech's heart was right. That's why God stopped him from committing the sin of adultery. Why is that so easy? I mean, genius Calvinists, these guys. Now, I, I slam these Calvinists so hard because I don't, you don't watch their debates. You don't watch how they deal with uh, Bible-believing Christians or people who oppose Calvinists. They talk in a way that talk down on you. And they act like scholars... Well, uh, and then when I mention about, when I poke fun at their education that, you know, those schools that they graduated from, the seminaries that they graduated from, any, but there are people in my church who can go to, who can apply and get accepted and graduate from those schools. And I got people in my church, I graduated from a school that's higher class than them. And you know what those humble Calvinists did? Who does he think he is? He thinks that he's better than us. What a prideful jerk. Well, why did you rub your education on Christians who didn't graduate from seminaries then, huh? These are hypocrites, evil, evil people. And I hope you're watching and you heard me say that. So then, notice how easy that was to debunk them. Did you notice that? At first you thought it was hard, right? Oh my goodness, what are we going to do? God withheld him from sinning. And look at the verses behind it. <laughs> then you'll find out. Okay. So just look at the verses behind it. Now, not even that, the same verse. Verse 6. It's so self-explanatory. God, God said, I know that thou didst this in the what? Integrity of thy heart. That's why, for I also withheld thee from sinning against me. See that? Oh my goodness, just read the verse, all right? Genius, uh, Next time Mr. Y pulls that up in the debate, just use that, okay? Oh, my goodness. He's talking about context, context, exegesis, exegesis. Don't put eisegesis. Exegesis, he didn't even read verse 6. Exegesis, yeah. Oh, my goodness. All right, verse 7, all right. I can go three hours ranting on Calvinists, to be honest, all right? Why? Because I'm fleshly, forgive me, pray for me, all right? Coming from an educated background, the one thing that I disdain the most is when there are honest, sincere, living Christians who want to serve the Lord and follow what is truth. Some guy uses his education for his advantage to mentally abuse a person. Okay, I hate that, all right? I hate that. 
That's why I slam the liberal world and the Calvinist world very hard because they always prize education. They think if they have a degree behind them, that's an automatic cop-out card, you know? Preach. Yeah, preach, amen. All right, verse 7. Now, therefore, restore the man his wife, for he is a prophet. All right, so God says, okay, so now that's why what you should do is restore Abraham his wife. Give back the wife to him. Because Abraham is a prophet, and he shall pray for thee. <laughs> if I was Abimelech hearing that, I would have been in shock mode. God's like, it's okay, it's okay, just give back the wife to the man. You know, because he's a man of God, you know, he's a pastor, and uh, he, he's going to pray for you. What do you think Abimelech is thinking after he hears that? What? <laughs> I'm the good guy here. I'm the good guy here. And that's the bad guy. And you're telling me he's a blank and a blank, blank. You know, Abimelech is probably thinking, a pastor? <laughs> so he's really mad. Abraham, he's a prophet. And uh, as a prophet, Abraham is going to pray for Abimelech. Why does he need Abraham's prayers? Well, and thou shalt live. And if thou restore her not, know thou that thou shalt surely die, thou and all that are thine. Meaning... Uh, if he prays for you, then you will live. So he's still on that death row right now, all right? Yeah, God's wrath is on him. So that's why he needs Abraham's prayers. And the verse says, if you, rest, uh, if you don't restore her, okay, if you don't uh, give back the wife to Abraham, then know for a fact that you, that you are going to really die. And you and all. All that belongs to you. Now notice God keeps saying you, you a lot, right? Thou shalt live. Thou, know thou, that thou shalt surely die. Thou and all that are thine. <laughs> He's scaring Abimelech. You, 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 you. <laughs> My goodness. Now this is the first time prophet is mentioned in your Bible. All right, Enoch, he's a prophet. We know that in Jude. Noah, he's a prophet for preaching. But this is the first mention of prophet is Abraham. First mention prophet. Now, notice why Abraham would qualify well to be a prophet. Let me know if I'm out of bounds, okay? So the first mention of prophet why is it given to Abraham? There are some things that you want to know about prophets. If you know the basic definition of a prophet, basically they receive something divine from God, right? They communicate well with God. Now think about it. If it relies on communication with God, that might explain why Abraham, he was called the friend of God, remember? Why? You read Genesis 18. We looked at so many examples that Abraham had a great prayer life, intercessory prayer. Intercessory prayer, that's the highest uh, form of communication. See, you're interceding on someone's behalf. You're communicating them for him. So there's no doubt from that in Genesis 18 that we looked at before, uh, Abraham definitely qualifies to be a prophet. How he able had to have deep communion, fellowship with God. So the idea is this. Why is he qualified to be a prophet? Is because of his intimate fellowship. Now, some of you don't realize that you guys are prophets as well. You guys are actually prophets. So then how well is your fellowship with the Lord? How deep is your communication with the Lord, right? If you have a deep communication and fellowship then the Lord can, uh, that's why the Lord gave Abraham the title of prophet. Now, guys, you got to realize this. You don't, just, to get a title like this, you just don't get it. For the majority uh, of the Old Testament time, 4,000 years, prophet, priest, king, you have to earn it. You have to be born into it. You have to do something. You Christians didn't have to earn it. Or physically get born into it. All you had to do was just, if you want it, you can take it. That It's called salvation. Amen. Amen. All right. Let's look at Genesis 20. Genesis 20. 
Therefore Abimelech rose early in the morning and called all his servants and told all these things in their ears, and the men were sore afraid. All right, let me explain every word. That therefore Abimelech uh, got up early in the morning. He summoned all his servants, called all of them, told them everything uh, where their ears have heard it, and then all the people got afraid after that. Sore afraid. So the phrase is used as very afraid. Sore means like very. Then Abimelech called Abraham and said unto him. So Abimelech summons Abraham and says, What hast thou done unto us? And what have I offended thee that thou hast brought on me and on my kingdom a great sin? So notice that Abimelech says to Abraham, What did you do to us? What did I do to offend you that you brought on, uh, that you gave me and my kingdom this great sin that you made us commit, that you made us commit this great sin? Did we do anything to offend you? Thou hast done deeds unto me that ought not to be done. The king Abimelech said, you've done, uh, you've done something to me that should not be done. Now notice this is a heathen pagan king. He, he realizes that adultery is not a normal act. He says, done deeds unto me that ought not to be done. Now isn't that amazing? Whereas nowadays you live in a day and age where adultery is just normal. This even pagan king has more sense than an educated American who grew up in Protestant Christian America with a hypocrite in God we trust at the back. <laughs> wow, isn't it amazing? So he realized this is a blasphemous thing. It's a heinous sin. Heathen pagans can take sin more seriously than so-called Christianized Americans. Verse 10, and Abimelech said unto Abraham, What sawest thou that thou hast done this thing? So Abimelech asked Abraham, What did you see that made you do this? Okay, here we go. This is a sermon right here. You ready? All right, so we're going to close it off right here. Let me write them down. Let me know when I'm out of bounds. Okay, why did Abraham commit this sin? Now, notice that Abraham, he is the prophet, the friend of God, of mighty spiritual saint, and yeah, he even messed up too. All right, how did it start? One, you go a little south or a little backsliding. Not big, just little. Right? We read that verse one. He didn't do backsliding like before. It's just a little bit. All right, that's the trick. So that's verse one. Number two, what did he see? You see something. Like Lot, right? He saw something. That started his worldly life. Abraham's following the same thing. He saw something that made him sin at verse 10. Wow, a pagan king said that. You notice that? A pagan king said that. What did you see? That pagan king can preach. He's a better preacher than the prophet right here. And Abraham said, so this is what the pastor of Bible Baptist Church said. He must have a good reason. Because I thought, oh, three, you think, you thought something. And then the thought is fake, it's not real. Abraham thought what? Surely the fear of God is not in this place, and they will slay me for my wife's sake. Certainly, for a fact, I know 100%, these people in this place, they don't fear God, and they're going to kill me because of my wife, for my wife's sake. Isn't that how you always think, church? I know I'm going to, what? You're going to what? I know this bad thing's going to happen. I know this will happen. I know this. You know? Really, how do you really know? Verse 12, and yet indeed she is my sister. Oh, stop. She is the daughter of my father, but not the daughter of my mother, and she became my wife. Oh, Abraham says, but nevertheless, see, yet, indeed, 
It's true, indeed, Sarah is my sister. Why? The explanation is, she's the daughter of my father. But, you know, she's not the daughter of my mother. Because remember, I showed you at Genesis 12 that uh, Abraham's father had multiple wives, right? So then uh, Abraham, so then Abraham came from one woman, whereas Sarah came from the other woman. Now that was normal during the times of Genesis. I've explained that. So I'm not going to uh, get on to that part, all right? Why? Uh, but later on in the Mosaic Law and today, it's uh, considered wrong, but I'm not going to get into that. I already explained that last time, okay? Point is, is that uh, Abraham, he was telling the truth, you know, and she became my wife. Now, in his mind, it might be the truth, but do you think Abimelech is going to think, oh, you are telling the truth, I understand? <laughs> no. What do you think when you make an excuse, which is true, how do you think the other person will take it as? Oh, it's truthful, so I excuse you? You give excuses after that. Now, it's the steps, a little backsliding. Then you see something. Hey, you listening? Oh, picture yourself, you Christian. Just a little bit, right? Then you see something. Then you think something where you believe it. And then you make excuses for it. Now, let's keep reading. And it came to pass. All right, it just so happened, right? That's the phrase. When God caused me to wander from my father's house, oh, boo-boo. He's saying, uh, when God made me get away from my father's house and I started wandering all over, because remember, he was sojourning, right? <laughs> so notice what happens. There's something in your heart that's still against God. All right, you have something. The heart has unconsciously it just comes out of your mouth but somewhere deep down inside your heart church you still have something against god there's not an understanding or a faith in what god does it's that bitterness look abraham he walked by faith he trusted god left everything but in spite this is amazing listen up in spite of walking out by faith, trusting in God, like a pastor would, right, sometimes? Like, Lord, I surrender the call to the ministry. Hey, let's be honest. We're human, we're flesh. Sometimes deep down inside our heart, we go, oh, Lord, why'd you let me leave that place to be in this ministry? Lord, you're the one that caused this thing to happen. And that thing resides. You know what I mean? It came out of him. This was never shown for so many years on, uh, in Abraham's life ever since he moved out until now. So he held it for a long time. Okay? That bitterness or that thing against the Lord in, deep down inside your heart has to be surrender and gone, Christians. I don't know if you still have that, but it can linger. It's still sleeping inside your heart. You've got to surrender that. That's why you're going to do these things. See that? Now, keep reading. That I said unto her, this is thy kindness which thou shalt show unto me. So, because God's the one that caused him to wander around and no place to go, Abraham tells his wife, I want you, uh, you're going to, this is a kind act that you're going to do for my sake, that you're going to show to me. At every place whither we shall come, say of me, he is my brother. Any place we go, uh, where, uh, whither, so the idea is wherever we go, wherever we arrive at, describe, uh, tell others about me that he's my brother. So if you combine 13 and 14, the idea is this. God's the one that caused me to wander all this place. So, man, I'm so afraid about who's going to uh, kill me. So every place that I go, I have to tell her, you know, please be kind to me. And the kind act that you can do to spare my life is just tell everybody that we go around, he's my brother. <laughs> See, so notice it's blaming God, right? You know, uh, notice uh, who did the same thing as well. It's Adam, right? Adam, when he disobeyed the Lord and took the fruit off the tree, what did he say to God? The woman that thou gavest to me, she gave me the fruit of the tree and I did eat. 
See, it's always blaming God something. So a heart that goes against God. And then six, you blame God and justify the wrongdoing. Hence, these are the perfect six steps to commit sin. That's a good preaching right there. Okay, uh, we will stop right here and continue our next verses uh, next Sunday. Father God, I pray that today's teachings have been a blessing to the hearers and help us to learn our lessons from Abraham and Lot and not follow their same mistakes. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen.